With a population of 1.4 billion and a wealth of natural resources, Africa embodies vast and diverse economic potential. Boasting the youngest population worldwide, the Mata continent also is considered the world's last growth engine that has the power to save the global economy. So we can't highlight enough the importance. So anticipation runs high here in Korea that the upcoming South Korea-Africa summit will catalyze mutual growth and prosperity. So today we zoom in on the bargaining partnership between these two regions. And for expert insights, we're now joined by former South Korean ambassador to South Africa and Uganda, Park jong on the line. Good morning, Professor Park. It's good morning. Uh, not to uh, interrupt your hello, but he's also the currently a visiting professor at Yonsei University's Graduate School of International Studies and the KDI School of Public Policy. Now that our listeners are all caught up, let's get started, Professor Park, on the first high-level summit to be hosted. Uh, South Korea-Africa summit will be held next week, notably a first of its kind. Can you tell us about its significance and the expected outcome? Okay, so first, the significance. Uh, this summit is very special and significant in that the vast majority of, of African countries are expected to attend uh, to be the largest uh, multilateral summit since the launch of Yoon suk yeol administration. Mm. And it is the first time ever that Korea is hosting a multilateral summit with the African continent states. And Korea and Africa have been, of course, steadily engaged in expanding cooperation since Korea obtained the observer status in AU, the African Union, in 2005. But today, in the face of dynamic shifts in the global land scale and unprecedented global challenges, there is a rising need for Africa and Korea to establish a new strategic partnership to effectively deal with these uh, challenges. And I would say the summit will be a historic milestone Mm. in making Africa and Korea genuine and equal partners, addressing shared challenges, and forging new pathways for cooperation by unlocking opportunities for uh, mutual growth. Mm. Okay, and as for the expected outcomes, Okay, first, the main theme of the summit is 3S, shared growth, sustainability, and solidarity. Hmm. And the expected outcomes can be summed up as the following five points. Hmm. First, it's about strategic partnership. It is to enhance this partnership based on the network established amongst the leaders of Africa and Korea. Mm -hmm. The second is trade and investment, Hmm. Uh, expanding trade and investment by setting up institutional foundation and promoting public-private partnerships. Hmm. Third is to respond jointly to key global challenges and also pave the way to accelerate digital uh, transformation uh, for Africa. Hmm. And fourth, it's about also securing global supply chains mm. for the key minerals and energy sources by shaping cooperation mechanism. Mm. And lastly, uh, it is to build a long-term friendship by boosting people-to-people, cultural, and academic exchanges. Mm. And specifically on one of those fronts of mutual interest, the big question becomes, could we foster economically beneficial relationships? So how do you as an expert assess the current level of Korea's economic cooperation with key African nations? Yes, so this is hugely important. Mm. Uh, But as of right now, the economic ties are actually not up to our potential. Mm. And the major uh, trade partners for Korea in Africa, of course, include the big countries like South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, Algeria, and Kenya, and small countries like Liberia, uh, which engage in transit trade, and Togo, are also our important trade partners. Mm-hmm. So the latest uh, data has here, 2022, uh, the trade volume between Korea and Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, to be specific, mm-hmm amounted to about $20.4 billion 
it is an increase of 28% over the previous year. Uh-huh. Uh, but, it is, but, but, but the issue is that it is only 2% of our total, Korea's total trade with the world, mm-hmm. okay, mm-hmm. which is uh, mm-hmm. more than $1 trillion. Okay, and now let me touch upon the investment. Okay. So investment of Korea uh, to Africa uh, amounts to $2.68 billion. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is accumulated amount from 2013 to 2022. And this constitutes only 0.4% mm-hmm. of Korea's t- total overseas investment. So we see that uh, there's much room for uh, improvement. Uh We've, we're doing better, at least it seems, based on some of the numbers that you've provided for us. But 2% trade volume is still pretty limited, so we could do better. So how has economic cooperation between South Korean and African nations evolved over the past decade? And why does it still remain relatively weak? Uh, despite our steady collaboration mm-hmm. and our commitment uh, for uh, broaden uh, cooperation, uh, both, as you've seen, both trade and investment with Africa have not noticeably increased uh, over the last decade, Mm. remaining more or less the same uh, range. And this figure, this latest figure of 2022, I think, Mm -hmm. reflects the impact of COVID uh, pandemic, Uh uh uh, which has had negative impact. So I think we are in the process of recovering, so we shall see. But the the main reason why uh, economic cooperation uh, remains uh, relatively weak uh, is because despite the abundance in natural resources and potential for economic development in Africa, uh, the business environment in Africa still uh, needs to be worked on to be improved. And there's still this perception that Africa, African markets are rather high risk uh, with low returns. Therefore, Uh, Various measures in terms of policies and institutional arrangements uh, needs to be put in place. And also African countries, I think, have a large uh, part in this to to undertake. But the Korean government also uh, prioritizes uh, investment in Africa. Mm -hmm. And it places uh, emphasis to establish a conducive environment for Korean companies uh, to collaborate with African counterparts. For example, uh, President Yoon song uh prioritizes extending support, in particular to Korean companies uh, venturing abroad. So, mm-hmm. in line with this, mm-hmm. the Korean government focuses on bolstering institutional frameworks, including the expansion of, expansion of economic partnership agreements, and also trade and investment promotion frameworks to uh, achieve this. And of course, times and priorities have changed uh, for this conservative co- uh, government. But if we look to the past, uh, according to other pundits, more politically conservative Korean presidential administrations focused on maybe fostering ties to Africa with an eye towards maybe countering or isolating North Korea further. And it's the liberal governments that tended to focus more on mutually economically uh, developing relationships. So the question becomes, what's in it for the Yoon government. The Yoon administration, ever since its launch, as you mentioned, has strived to expand high-level exchanges with African nations. What's driving the Yoon government's proactive efforts to bolster economic partnerships with the African continent? Yes, so you you made a very accurate and interesting uh, assessment about the past uh, administration's Mm -hmm. uh, orientation. Uh, You're correct. Uh, But Yoon Yoon's administration approach is all encompassing, mm. and I think it's more uh, advanced uh, than previous governments. Okay. Uh, the current government thinks that this summit of 2024 uh, with Africa will provide the best opportunity for Korea to accompany uh, Africa for its proactive development and based on its Korea's experience and expertise. And what drives Korean government is such a proactive stance to bolster uh, economic partnership with Africa is first uh, Africa's great potential uh, as the world's last frontier with potentially huge markets 
demographic dynamism and the collective diplomatic power of having 54 uh, UN members. Mm-hmm. And also for, from the perspective of Korea, it wants to become true uh, global pivotal state by enhancing its role in the world stage, by upgrading and intensifying partnership mm-hmm. with African countries to bring it to new heights. Mm-hmm. The great opportunity for Korea now is that of its soft power, I think, which is at its peak. Hence, I think it's very timely and appropriate that Korea actively engage with Africa mm-hmm. at a such high level for mutually beneficial uh, relationship. Mm. It's a limited example, but K-pop in Africa sounds exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, on the other hand, uh, why do African nations value partnerships with South Korea? You alluded to digital transformation, people-to-people exchanges, culture, or soft power, essentially. What are some areas of their particular interest? Yes, this is also a very good question. Mm. And first of all, this is a multilateral summit. Mm. Uh, but the multilateral summit is nothing new uh, to African countries. Uh, by the way, uh, they have participated in many uh, multilateral summits with other major countries, including mm-hmm. Japan, China, uh, Russia, United States. I- India, United Of course, mm-hmm. of course, the, the big countries, mm-hmm. the superpower, United States, and the Western powers, also British and also French, uh, they have been engaging with Africa on m- numerous you know, occasions. Mm-hmm. So uh, they are not uh, new to this global uh, this fora. But I think besides discussing global issues in Korea, I think for African countries, what is particularly interesting to them are the bilateral summits, uh, business deals with Korea, and agreements, MOU uh, signing, I think which are powerful uh, incentives, uh, motivators for African heads of state to visit Korea at this time. Mm -hmm. Because for them, this is a great opportunity to showcase uh, their, their strengths and their possibilities uh, in front of Korea to attract Korea's interest and collaboration in the key areas that they need partnership. And it's a valuable opportunity for them also to see what Korea can offer in various areas that Korea has uh, advantage in, mm. uh, in the sectors that Africa sees very attractive. Mm. And also, furthermore, it is a good opportunity for the leaders to come in and to see firsthand, understand uh, Korea's position, and also various uh, agencies that are relevant, like COICA, COTRA, uh, EDCF, and industries. And when they meet with them, uh, they will learn uh, what is possible and what is necessary to engage in effective uh, collaboration. Mm. So for many purposes, I think uh, there's great incentives Mm. uh, for African countries uh, to take part in this uh, summit. Uh, In some of your past interviews, you mentioned that Korea should adopt a quote-unquote differentiated strategy to mitigate the challenges of being a latecomer in engaging with African countries. Could you elaborate on this? Uh, Can, as you've said in past interviews, Africa maybe emulate the Sema Arundong? Oh, yes. Surely. (laughs) Yes. So that, you're, you're correct, uh, rightly so. And why not? Because now Korea has uniquely evolved into a very remarkable success case of development, which appeals uh, greatly to Africa. And because we are also collaborating, but also in a way competing with other major, major nations. So we have to uh, understand uh, approaches of other countries. For example, the Western countries, uh, their collaboration is mostly in the area of uh, humanitarian needs, basic mm. needs, uh, universal values, helping build institutions, governance, promoting universal values, security, and so forth. In countries like China, contrast with their approach, mainly focusing on infrastructure and engineering. So for Korea, I, w- I thought about this, what could be our position, our strategy? Mm. After all, uh, we are not as strong economically as great Western powers or China or even Japan in terms of hard power as a GDP. Mm. 
But we have this characteristic of being OECD, member of OECD countries, uh, but also Asian country uh, that has unique advantages. So what I uh, propose to differentiate in, in our strategy is to have all this together. For example, uh, we are a member of OECD, so we have to also abide mm-hmm. by the global standards, mm-hmm. and we also uh, uh, adapt okay, such an uh, approach taken by the West, but also we are interested in the uh, industrial sector, uh, what the China does, although we cannot uh, directly send uh, people to construct infrastructures uh, because of our wage level. Mm-hmm. And with this plus alpha, I would say, <laughs> it's a human capital development. Right. So this experience, I think, is very unique and it can appeal. So human development experience is very special and successful. And I would say it's a holistic human development, by the way, and also involves development of social capital as well. Mm-hmm. And one of the cases you mentioned, I think prominent uh, example is the New Village Movement of Sema mm-hmm. which greatly appeals to African countries. So we have this, I think, uh, possibilities of relative strength and relative uh, comparative advantage mm-hmm. uh, uh, in, in such area. Mm-hmm. Maybe even some similarities that could help, as you've mentioned, in building up and enhancing human and social capital there. So really covering all bases there. But the reality is, I'm sure challenges remain. So what are some of the biggest hurdles down the road? And how do we go about addressing them? Yes. So, uh, of course, there's a challenges. And the first thing that comes to my mind uh, is, uh, frankly, uh, in case of Korea, is getting uh, full interest from our public and support uh, from our nation. And the factor is uh, the influence of our politics. Mm. So we saw uh, in the past that sometimes, because our government is a one-term government, okay, unlike the United States or Japan mm. or even China, many countries which have a continuity in their policy, uh, our government changes uh, after five years. Mm-hmm. So this political momentum can shift and can lose steam uh, in the process of the change in the government. Mm-hmm. So what I propose is that we should have bipartisan support for collaborating with African countries, mm-hmm. uh, which I think uh, should not be a subject to domestic politics. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. Uh, And also on the part of African countries, I think the potential hurdle uh, is also uh, their active engagement, their attention to do their best to smooth out the implementation Mm. of the things that are agreed. Mm. So it is important to come to an agreement, come to terms, uh, but also important is to follow up. So for African countries, I think it's crucial uh, that they, they pay extra attention with extra care take measures as a follow-up. And these calls for for greater actions, both on the part of Korea and African countries alike, Mm. uh, and also many stakeholders on both sides uh, that are involved. Professor Park, you've already alluded to a a host of uh, partnership uh, areas between Korea and Africa, including but not limited to many economic domains, people-to-people exchanges, culture. So for our final question today, in what sectors can Korea and African nations pioneer new collaborative ventures? Yes, so already the economic cooperation has been highlighted. Mm -hmm. So trade investment is the the main area. But of course, we should move beyond uh, economic domains. And I think one of the best candidates are uh, education, Mm. training for strengthening governance uh, for the public officials, Mm. for the delivery of public service. So enhancing governance, capability of public sector. And this also involves uh, building human capacity. And I think human capacity is the most important drivers of successful development. Mm. And because in such countries as Africa, I think the role of the state, uh, the bureaucrats, the government agencies are important to lead the way uh, to also help promote capacity of the private sector. Mm. And in Africa, there's no lack of uh, information about institutions and policies. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that has been provided, assisted by uh, international communities and consultants. Hmm. And it is not lack of these, but and also not lack of resources, really, hmm. uh, that is at the heart of the you know, challenge, but rather it's a lack of implementation, okay. the problem of management. Hence, I think it's hugely important uh, that we build human capacity for implementation. Okay. And another area I can think of mm-hmm. uh, for, for collaborative ventures uh, is in agriculture. For example, the K rice belt. Ah. Yeah, that is uh, being pursued mm. and will be uh, highlighted during the summit. Uh, this will be very uh, opportune and ideal. And also continue with the new village movement which will help rural development. Mm. And I can also cite, for example, our collaboration in countering malaria, mm. for example. Mm. There's a prominent you know, a Korean uh, organization, private organization, for example, called Korean Advocates Global Health. And the head of this organization is also the head of Korea and, and Malaria Alliance. Mm-hmm. So uh, we have this uh, very competent private sectors Mm. that are very interested in engaging uh, in the challenges that Africa face. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Park, for getting us uh, the big picture of what is to be expected at the upcoming Korea-Africa Summit and providing us a vision as to what future industries allow us for more clever and original collaborations. We appreciate your insights. Thank you very much. Okay, it was a great pleasure. Thank you very much. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.